Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Today is Reformation Day, and uh, if you don't know what that is, that's okay. Uh, it's a day that we set aside at the end of October every year uh, to celebrate the events that happened in Germany surrounding the Reformation. It's at the end of October because it was October 31st, 1517, that Luther nailed a document called the 95 Theses to the church door, uh, castle church door in Wittenberg, Germany. Uh, And many people, or most people really, kind of point to that as the beginning of the Reformation, the thing that sparked everything that followed in the Protestant Reformation. If you were at the voters meeting this year, uh, or this past uh, week, I guess, you, you already know that I looked back over the years that I've been here at Zion, and I preached on Reformation Day like all but two years that I've been here. So I've kind of run out of readings to preach on. There's not a new one at this point. But I realized this one actually is a little bit different for me because uh, I got the opportunity to go to Germany last year to see some of these places. And so it's the first time I've preached on Reformation Day since I've actually stood in some of these places where these things happen. I remember one day specifically, uh, we went to the Castle Church, the place where the 95 Theses were nailed up, and, and I was standing over Luther's tomb. Luther's buried right in the sanctuary of that church. I was standing over Luther's tomb and thought to myself, wow, I, I am who I am because of what happened right here in this room. It was an amazing feeling, thinking back on the Reformation and on all that had happened in Wittenberg and in Germany and ever since. And we celebrate those things today. in in Reformation Day. But it's actually not about the events, and it's not about the people. We have read on the altar at Reformation Day because we, we celebrate the work of the Holy Spirit. It's not about an individual person or a group of people. It's about the Holy Spirit working through people to bring the church back to the gospel. So I've run out of readings, and we're looking at Romans 3 this morning for two reasons. One, because it's the one that I preached on least recently, (laughs) Reformation Day. But two, because this is one of the places in Scripture that God, uh, God, through the, the Apostle Paul, spells out the gospel and the purity of the gospel most specifically and most clearly. And he doesn't just talk about the gospel, he talks about the law stuff too. He talks about the things that we often fall into. He talks about through the law comes knowledge of sin. But most importantly, he says, by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in God's sight. So I want to think about that to begin with, because that's something that we tend to slide into, uh, you know, thinking about things in terms of law, earning our way to heaven, whether we know it or not. And it's not just individuals that tend to fall into that. The entire church had done that before the Reformation. To illustrate that, I want to go about 150 miles west of Wittenberg to a little town called Vindheim, to this church. This is St. Catherine's Church in Vindheim. Uh, St. Catherine's was founded in in the early 1300s, so it's a fairly old church, of course. It was founded about 200 years before the Reformation, and when this church was built, people would come here, and they'd hear about salvation by grace, but they'd forget the other word on that poster behind me, sola gratia, grace alone. They'd hear about salvation by Jesus, and what they'd hear is, Jesus gets you on the staircase, but you got to climb the rest of it yourself. Sure, salvation is by grace, but you also got to do things like confess every single little sin, because if you miss one, God, God can't forgive you, and you'll be condemned. You got to do things like buy indulgences so that God for, can forgive your sins. You've got to do things like give to the church so that God can forgive your sins. You've got to do things like reverence relics so that God can forgive your sins. Salvation by grace, yes, but also by works, also by what you do. And the problem with that is nobody ever knew whether they were at the top of the staircase. They knew they were on it, but they never knew whether they'd made it to the top. It was kind of like my high school English class. I had an English teacher. <laughs> I had an English teacher in, in high school, and she would uh, she would assign essays as English teachers tend to do. And our question was always the same. It was probably your question in high school English too. How many words do you want for this essay? 
And we'd ask her that all the time, and she gave us this infuriating answer. It just drove me nuts. She would say, I just want a thorough answer. Oh. I, I'm not going to lie. I've started to give that as a teacher, by the way. So, uh, But it infuri- it, at the time, it drove me nuts because I, I thought, well, what in the world does that mean? My idea of thorough and your idea of thorough may be totally different things. If I got a word count, I can sit down and count the words. I can know whether I've made it. I can know whether or not I've done enough. But with this, this uh, answer that she would give, I just want a thorough answer. I had no idea whether I'd met the bar, whether I'd reached the top. And that's the issue with salvation by works. You have no idea whether you've ever met the bar, whether you've ever gotten to the top. But it's such a prevalent idea. I mean, everything we do is a transaction of some kind, and it's such a prevalent idea that we tend to slide into it too. It's not just the church. How do you know you're getting to heaven? Well, we tend to answer that with things like, well, I, you know, I've been a pretty good person. I've never killed anybody. I, I, I've done a pretty good job. I've done my best with what I've been given. Or even worse, things like, well, at least I'm not as bad as so-and-so. We tend to say that one a lot. And that's a sliding back into this same mindset where you're always on the staircase and you never know if you're at the top. Luther took this idea really seriously and it drove him nuts. He would go to confession for hours and hours and hours because he saw himself as on this staircase, never quite knowing if he'd reached the top, never quite knowing if he'd confessed every single little sin. And he started to see God not as loving at all, but rather as a judge who was just waiting to condemn him, just waiting for him to miss something. So he could send him off, condemn him at the end of his life. He never knew where the the bar was. But Paul in Romans 3 is actually really clear about where the bar is. And Luther realized this after a while. Paul says, there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is no distinction. What Paul is saying is, there is no doing enough. There is no being good enough. And ultimately, if you're leaning on what you do, there is no hope. And once Luther figured that out, I mean, it was crushing for him, but what he realized also was that he needed Jesus. That's where Paul takes us to in Romans chapter 3. He says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the very next verse is, and are justified freely, freely, by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. That's the gospel in all of its truth, in all of its purity. And the gospel changes things. Not Luther, not the other reformers, not the emperors, not the events of the Reformation. The gospel changed things. Because it is an idea like no other idea that you will ever hear. It's the idea that there is a free lunch. There's only one. But it's the one that you need more than absolutely anything else. It is salvation in the eyes of God. An invitation into the presence of God. The Reformation went out of Wittenberg and went all the way to Windheim. It made its way there years and years after to St. Catherine's. We got to visit this church when I was in Germany, and it's not just the church building. There's another building that's full of offices, and we went up to this building full of offices and went in the door, and in the office there were these two women who were working, and uh, I came up and knocked on the door, and I said something like this. I said, uh, uh, Guten Tag, wir sind Amerikaner, uh, können wir die Kirche sehen, which is really bad German. <laughs> And it's supposed to mean, I don't know what it actually means, but it's supposed to mean something like, hey, we're from America, could we see the church? And she turns around and and she goes, in English, yeah, no problem, I'll show you the church. (laughs) Give me five or ten minutes and I'll finish what I'm doing, I'll come show you. I was like, oh, great, we're going to get a lot further with your English than we will with my German. So she shows us the church. We got to go inside. We got to look around. And the cool thing about the inside of St. Catherine's is it's laid out in a lot the same way as Zion. It's got two wings over there. It's got a main section. Uh, it's got uh, a, uh, an altar about like ours. And in fact, here's the altar. Uh, yeah, it's kind of cool. It's a smaller altar than we have. The triptych in the back is post-Reformation. Um, but this is the place where people worship. 
This is a place where people commune at St. Catherine's. Uh, and as we were looking around, we sort of looked all around the sanctuary, and at the very end, this, this lady who's showing us around goes, hey, let me show you one more thing. She goes up to the altar, and she pulls the altar cloth back and pulls off the pyramids, and there's this little block of wood. And she pries the block of wood out with her car key, and underneath it was this. That little hole up towards the top. And I said, what in the world is that? And she said, that's where the relic was. I said, really? And she said, yeah, this is called St. Catherine's Church because that was our relic. We had one of St. Catherine's teeth in our altar. That was the relic of the church. That was what people would come. That was what they would uh, fear, love, and trust in. That was what they would go to and reverence so that God could forgive their sins. And now it's empty. It's gone. The truth is lost. They have no idea where it went. And the hole is empty, I realized. Because after the Reformation, after the gospel came to Vindheim, after it came to St. Catherine's, they realized that their works were empty too. And their relics were empty too. In fact, anything they could do to save themselves was empty. But what Jesus did was enough to save everybody. They didn't need anything else. That's the Reformation. That's the purity of the gospel changing things. See, the gospel message, when you get it, it doesn't leave room for any of that other stuff. It doesn't leave room for your, your works or your status or your nationality or your birth or anything else. There is no distinction for those things. This thing is empty. Because when the Holy Spirit brought the gospel to these people, the purity of the gospel, they realized there was no room on their altar for anything but Jesus. And the gospel means there is no room in your heart for anything but Jesus either. It means that you have been saved personally, individually, by the blood of Jesus. Part of the real beauty of the Reformation, I think, when we reflect on this every year, is recognizing how the Holy Spirit does that, brings us into the church, preserves his church. Part of it is recognizing that he preserved the church 500 years ago in a little town in Germany, and it shows us something about how God preserves the gospel and passes it down from one generation to the next generation. One of the things we got to see in St. Catherine's Church as we were looking around was this. This is, the, uh, this is the, the new baptismal font. It is from the early 1500s. So if you're ever worried about how fast things change around here, <laughs> just use that as perspective. This is the baptismal font. And so for, for centuries, people have come to this baptismal font and they've been brought into the family of God. The Word of God has been combined with the water here at this baptismal font for 500 years. People have been justified freely by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, at this very baptismal font for years and years and years. They have died with Christ. They have been raised with Christ. They have been brought into the family of God, including my family. That's why we were here. It's a little town in Germany. It's not very big. It makes Bethalto look like a big city. But it was my family that had been baptized for hundreds of years in this very baptismal font, the Libkamans, until they came to America. And then they got baptized here, southern Illinois, Washington State, Trinity Edwardsville, and two of them right here, in this room, in this place. And you've got a story like that, too. There have been a string of baptisms that brought you here. Maybe it's not your family. Maybe it's the friend that you brought with you today. Maybe it's somebody you don't even remember. But there is a way that the Holy Spirit has preserved you, brought you into the church, the church he founded in creation, the church that Jesus died for after it fell into sin, the church that spread all over the world after Pentecost, the church that he brought back to the pure gospel in the Reformation, and that he preserved through years and years and years, combining the water and the word, whether it was here or across town or across the world. 
you too were brought into the faith, brought into the gospel, and God preserved his church in your life. I'm out of readings to preach on on Reformation Day because there's really only four of them. We do them every year. But if I had to add one, it would be Second Corinth, or, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Some of you probably know that. But I like those verses because it's like the Apostle Paul is using the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Spirit is using the Apostle Paul to speak directly to you and say, by grace, you have been saved through faith. It is a gift of God, not by your own works, so that no one may boast. And so we're going to close with those verses today, but I've changed them a little bit. I've changed them into a confession so that we can say back to God what, the, what God has said to us and remind ourselves and remind the people around us that we have been brought into the grace of God by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Let's say these words together. For by grace I have been saved through faith. And this is not my own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that I may not boast. Amen. And now may the peace of God that passes all understanding guard our hearts and our minds, keeping them steadfast in Christ Jesus. Amen.